Good morning again. It's good to be worshiping together, and I'm excited about this new series that we'll be in, talking through the book of Hebrews. And I don't know about you, but I find it very easy to get lost. My wife did some research for me this week because she's really good at research. And we were talking about how easy it is uh, for people wandering through the national parks to get lost. In 2017 alone, 3,600 people that they know of got lost in national parks. Imagine going and visiting a national park and just not being able to find your way out. No idea. Yellowstone looks nice. Think I'll stay. Of those 3,600 people, about 180 of them died from not being able to find their way out. And I imagine that in every single one of those cases, they did not have a guide. They didn't have somebody guiding them. And our impulse, our thought, is that we can go about our lives, we can do the things that God has called us to do without a guide. We can figure it out on our own. Christianity is not that hard. Following Jesus can't be that difficult. I'm going to figure this out on my own. But the Lord has revealed to us through his word that we need him. And we need him to guide us. Because the road we travel, the life that we live is so much more challenging and more difficult than navigating the wilds of a national park. You may not feel that way all the time, you're sitting behind a desk, or you're sitting at home, or you're dealing with family issues, but I assure you, it is much more unpredictable and much more dangerous. So today, as we look at the beginning chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter one, I want us to talk about how Jesus is a better guide. He is a better guide for us than ourselves in particular, but than any other guidance we could find. So let's start by asking the questions, what makes a good guide? That's what we're going to talk about today. What makes a good guide? And how is Jesus this better guide? And the first is that he is clear. Jesus is clear. Look at verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. One of the key ideas of Christianity is that God has revealed himself. Now, other religions, other faiths will say, sure, yeah, okay, God has has shown himself to us. But Christianity is unique in that we believe that we would not be able to comprehend or even be aware of God's existence without his self-revelation. God would be the ultimate hide-and-seek champion if he chose to be so. We'd never be able to find him. And so God has chosen to reveal himself, one, through general revelation. This is mostly through nature. You go out into the world, you see the stars, you see the heavens, you see animals, you see plant life, and you think to yourself, man, there's no way this could have just happened by accident. There's too much order, there's too much uh, uh, focus, there's too much uh, systematic programming into all of this. This makes too much sense. Somebody had to design this. But then there's this thing called special revelation. And special revelation is unique in that it not only tells us that God exists, it tells us who God is, his characteristics, what he's like, what he's not like. And more importantly than all of that, or probably just as importantly as all of that, is what God's plan is for all of this that he made. What's his intention for me? What's his intention for you? What does God want from us? And so what Hebrews chapter 1 here, particularly in verse 1, is saying to us, throughout the ages, God has communicated this truth to us. He's communicated at different points through history. He sent prophets and angels and priests 
people to record his words, his thoughts, his ideas to us so that we can know who he is and what he's doing. He sent Moses and, and David and Daniel and Isaiah. And the ancient Hebrews believed that Moses actually received the Ten Commandments from the angels themselves as a mediator between the, him and God. We know that God is love and he's gracious and he's kind to us because of this special revelation that he has given to us. But then at just the right time, God didn't just send messengers. He sent himself. He sent his son to come and speak to us. And this is what is talked about in verse three. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. This imprint is like when, when, a, when a face is imprinted on a coin. And so you see it all the time. You see it every day. Every time you engage in commerce, you would see the face of this person on a coin and know to whom you were subjected, to know who was in charge. And so when we look at Jesus, we can see who God is. He's the superior form of communication. He's the best form of revelation. And this Jesus, it says in verse uh, 3 as well, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right high hand of the majesty on high. After he finished his work, after he died for our sins, after he died for all the ways that we rejected God's revelation, we said, no, 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 I don't want to do it your way, God. I want to do it my way. Jesus died to pay for that penalty. And then when it was done, after he was raised from the dead, he sat down until the end of all things. I think we radically underestimate how much and how much superior Jesus is to other forms of revelation. We underestimate how superior Jesus is to other forms of revelation. Back in the uh, 1700s, if you were on a ship and you want to communicate to another ship, you know what you would do? You would have a series of flags that would go up. And the different signals would mean different things. And so if you wanted the other ship that you were with uh, to turn hard to port, you would run up a series of flags. If you wanted them to come over for dinner, you would run up a series of flags. And that would work pretty well, right? You think, okay, I can see the flags. We're traveling together. They want me to come over. Great, I'm coming over. In my little boat, rowing over. But what happens if the day isn't so clear? What happens if you don't know the signals? What happens if you're in the middle of a storm or in a battle? Because in the 1700s, when a cannon would go off, there'd be smoke. And some of these ships had 50, 60 cannons all blasting away at each other. There's all the smoke. You can't see the signals. You can't identify them. But then they did this really cool thing later on. You know what they invented? The radio. And you could talk to people. You didn't have to worry about seeing them. You could communicate over long distances. Even the Titanic, as it was sinking, was able to send out a radio call. And ships that were nowhere near knew that the ship was in trouble. And now we've moved into the digital era. Where the means we have of communicating between ships, you've got satellites, GPS, all this stuff. Jesus is a vastly superior form of understanding who God is. He is the best way to understand him. When we look at Jesus, we see God. And to ignore that fact, to underestimate that, is to, to use signals when the radio or digital communication is right there for you. We vastly underestimate him. But at the same time, we also underestimate how much God wants to talk to us. We understand how much God actually wants to get to know you and to spend time with you and how much he wants you to get to know him. And I wonder if this is because we're subject to a lot of communication in our lives. We've got text, we've got email, we've got phone calls, we've got social media. I think one of the scariest things that happens to us in our day-to-day -day lives is actually receiving a phone call from a number you don't know. That pops up and you're like, oh, they're about to tell me about my warranty. <laughs> Spam detected. Or you're like, it's somebody that you do know is calling you and you're like, oh my gosh, this person still thinks their phone is a phone. 
It's just a thing where I get texts and I look at funny videos of cats. Don't they know this isn't a phone? It's where I keep all pictures of my grandkids. I don't use this as a phone. We are oversaturated with communication. And so when we think about the Lord and we think about his desire to communicate with us, it kind of falls into this category of I'm just overstimulated, I'm overcommunicated. But God in his grace wants to speak with us. And not just speak with us, he wants to include us. He wants to include us in his plan. He wants to tell us of his love and his mercy and his grace and his generosity to us. And then he wants to tell us how we fit into that plan. He wants to rescue us and redeem us. When you're following a guide, if you're out there in the wilderness, maybe some of you are going to go into the mountains this summer. Some of you might already be there. If you're going to do that and you're following a guide, you want a guide that's going to communicate with you clearly. It doesn't help if they know everything, but they can't tell you what they know, if they can't communicate with you. Did you ever have a teacher in school that was really, really smart, but had no idea how to teach? Like they were so smart, that they were kind of dumb. If you don't know a person like that, I have awful news for you. People, we need clear communication. And Jesus is the clearest form of communication to us. He communicates very clearly. And I know some of you are probably sitting here today, Travis. I've read the Bible. Have you read Revelation? There is nothing clear about that book. There's like the the first seven letters to, to the churches. And then after that, no one knows what's going on. That's why nobody ever preaches on Revelation other than the first seven letters. You know what I'm talking about. And that's fair. There are some things that are confusing in the Bible. In fact, the Bible itself calls itself out on how confusing it is sometimes. There's a part of one of Peter's letters where he's like, yeah, I know Paul's sometimes hard to understand. But that's how you know the Bible is real and authentic. It didn't edit out the parts where one apostle called out another apostle. The things that the Bible is clear on, it tells you everything you need to know, and it is crystal clear that Jesus is the Son of God. It is crystal clear that he came to die for our sins, that he was raised again, and that he's coming back one day to restore creation to what it was always meant to be and to be even better than that. The Bible is clear. There's no debate about that. It's clear. It's crystal clear. So how do you maintain this communication with God? How do you enter into communication with God if maybe that communication is broken down? How do you restore that signal? I think one of the best ways to do this is through the spiritual disciplines. If you're interested, you can read a couple books on the spiritual disciplines. Uh, Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline is one. Dallas Willard has one as well. But something like meditation is a really effective tool for restoring that communication. This is not Eastern European sort of or Eastern Asian uh, kind of uh, meditation where you empty your brain. You just kind of think of nothing. No, you, you chew on like a scripture. You chew on a passage or a word in scripture be great ways to meditate. What about studying? I'm sure many of you enjoy reading your Bible or studying. Get a commentary. Get, you can find a lot of really good ones online. And just sit there and learn about the scriptures and learn about the God uh, who loves you. What about simplicity? Maybe one of the reasons why we don't hear from God or hear from God very clearly is because we have too many distractions. We have too much stuff. Maybe you could go on a shopping fast for a while and just feel like, you know what, we're going to Dial things back a little bit. Simplify things. What about service? What about service? Helping other people, using your hands. We all know somebody, maybe you're this person, who can't talk without moving your hands. If you felt a sharp pain in your side, that was somebody elbowing you and being like, that's you. Got to talk with my hands. But maybe one of the ways that you talk to God is by using your hands. By moving your hands, serving other people. What about confession? If you've got sin that's ongoing, that's kind of floating around in your life, and you've not really talked to the Lord about it, you've not confessed and repented, that can throw up some smoke, make it where you can't clearly understand what's going on. And what about celebration? Giving glory to God, gratitude for God, for who He is, what He's done in your life. Maybe God wants to speak to you, but He's like, hey, hold on one second. We've been talking a lot, and you have not thanked me at all for this other stuff. 
Let's address that first before we move on. You need a clear guide. You gotta keep those lines of communication open and spiritual disciplines are a way to do that. But also, it doesn't really help if our guide is clear, if our guide doesn't know what he's talking about, right? Wouldn't it be awful if you were wandering in the wilderness, you had a guy who said he was a guide, and you're like, oh, so how many times have you gone through Yellowstone? How many times have you taken on people? Oh, I've never been through here before in my life. I just read about it on Wikipedia. Terrified, right? Absolutely terrified. We need a guide who is qualified, and Jesus is qualified. He is qualified to be our guide. Now, what the author of Hebrews is going to do next, he's made these big statements in the first four verses. He's going to move into a portion that I like to call citing his sources. This is where he's going in and he's telling you why he believes what he believes in the next kind of five chapter, verses five through 14. And the reason why he's doing this is, and we haven't talked about this yet, is who he's writing to. He's writing to the Hebrews. Now, I believe that these were uh, Jewish Christians that were living in Rome at the time. And they had converted to Christianity, and now they were tempted to return to Judaism. And so what he's doing is he's telling them that Jesus is way better, following Christ is way better than anything Judaism offered. And he's using the Old Testament to kind of drive his point home, to confirm this. And what this is going to revolve around, he's going to say that Jesus is better than the angels, better than any messenger received. And how he's going to do this, he's going to show that Jesus' character and his attributes qualify him to be a better messenger. So let's look at his character. Verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, or again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He's quoting two passages here. Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7. Both of these are messianic passages. They're focused around the Messiah, this idea that God was going to install a future king who was going to bring his kingdom reign on earth. Now Psalm 2 is really interesting because it's wrestling with, God, what are you going to do with all the nations that were rebelling against you? What are you going to do about that? And the author of Psalm 2, God's response is really interesting. Most people would say, oh, God's going to wipe them off the face of the planet. He's going to throw a hurricane at him or a famine or something. That's not what he does. You know what he does? The first thing he does is really cool. He laughs at them. It says the Lord God laughs at them. Imagine, you're not threatened. You're not concerned. He just kind of chuckles and like, oh, that's cute. They're trying to rebel against me. And then you know what he does? He installs his son as king in Zion. They're going to bow and they're going to worship him. He is going to be the one to whom they submit. That's his response. Now, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, angels are sometimes referred to as sons of God. But not one of them is ever called the son of God. This is a different person. This is someone who's of a different nature. He's divine in nature. He's a different nature than the angels. In 2 Samuel verse 7, or sorry, chapter 7, God is talking to David, and he tells David, I'm going to build for you a house, and I'm going to make for you a descendant. He's going to come from your line, and he's going to rule over everything forever. We know this person is Jesus. We believe that this person is Jesus. It's not an angel. It's not even David himself, despite David's greatness. This is the Son of God who will rule and reign and out of that, God reminds us in verses 6 and 7 exactly the role of the angels, how they, how they, what role they have in relation to this new guide and king. Verse 6, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. The angels are there to worship God, but they are there to worship this Messiah, this Son. The angels only worship God. That means he's divine. And they're also there to serve him. Satan himself says that the angels are there to serve the Son of God. And he's tempting Jesus. And this leads us to the attributes. Now these are not all the attributes of the Son of God. But these are the attributes that make him qualified to be our guide. And notice what's said in verse 8. 
But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. So if you're traveling somewhere, if you're going somewhere, you want the roads to be good, right? You want good work. You want, don't just want to know where you're supposed to go. You want to know that the way you're traveling is safe. It's one of the things that we trust our government for. There's road work. If you've ever been through Oklahoma, it's per, 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 perpetually under construction. I-35 is always under construction. Back in the ancient world, the king was responsible for keeping the roads safe. There would be thieves and brigands, people that were raiding the roads. And so a good king would keep the roads safe. And so by saying that his throne, bringing up the throne, it, it, Jesus is a guy who keeps things secure for us. He's not just going to lead you on a pathway that's good for you. He's going to lead you in a way that's going to bring you flourishing and life. Even if it's more difficult, even if it feels painful, you can trust God that he's going to bring you safe and secure. Verse 9 tells us that Jesus loves what is right and hates what is wrong. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Jesus loves righteousness. Everything he does for you, every guide, uh, every road he guides you to is going to be for your benefit and his glory. That's a comforting thought. Verses 10 through 12 talk about his eternality. Verse 10, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same and your years will have no end. If you've ever been with somebody who's been someplace before, maybe they visited it 10, 12 years ago and you go into the woods with them and they're like, oh yeah, I grew up here. Oh yeah, you know, I used to, I used to go all over this place. And you get to a part and they're like, well, I don't remember this place. It looks different than when I was here. And you're like, really? You said you knew what we were talking about. And here we are in the middle of nowhere. We're going to be one of those 3,600 that Pastor Travis talked about that's just lost in the wilderness. Or in North Park. I don't know. Wherever you wind up getting lost. Jesus is an amazing guide because he never changes. He never tires. He never wears out. And even if things change around him, he never does. He always knows. Have you ever had somebody that you were looking to for guidance, maybe a, a doctor or maybe a financial advisor, and you notice maybe the, the, the market's doing something different, you pick up the phone and you call and you're like, hey, what am I supposed to do? And it goes to voicemail and you're like, I really need to know right now what's going on. Your kid's sick, you call the pediatrician, and it's like, our offices are open between the hours of. And you're like, God, my kid's sick, please. Jesus is always available. He never sleeps. He never tires. He never changes. He is a guide that is always there, and that makes him a quality guide. But lastly, verses 13 and 14, and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? The salvation that we are to inherit, what qualifies Jesus as our guide is that he's the one who died for us. He's the one who gave himself up for us. He's the one who died to rescue us from a, a, a pointless existence. Just like we sang earlier, what Bill sang, running that race, but never reaching the end. He died to rescue us from that. Now, all of this may sound great, but you're like, Travis, this sounds really deep and theological and thanks for the lesson on Christology, but what does this have to do with my life? Our great temptation is that when things are get, go, get hard or get difficult, we revert back to things that we know. What was happening with these Hebrews, the, the Hebrew Christians' lives, was they were under persecution. And the reason why they were under persecution is because Christianity was a new religion. It was breaking with Judaism at the time, and Judaism was a, was a uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Was a protected religion under the Roman Empire because it existed when Rome conquered Palestine. But any new religions were put down. They were open to persecution. And Christianity, once it was breaking with Judaism, was seen as a new thing. And so these Hebrew Christians are realizing if we go back to Judaism, we're safe, we're protected. And we've got like 
75% of God's revelation? That's close enough. And the author of Hebrews is saying, no, 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 don't go back. Jesus is so much better. So much better. Now, many of you aren't tempted to, to go back and listen to angels, probably. But we all have ways of doing things, things that we were taught as a kid, things that we grew up thinking, things maybe that you, you have picked up as an adult or you picked up by watching other people who were successful in your field or other parents that you were kind of watching. You're like, hey, let's try that or whatever. We've all picked up bad guides along the way. We listen to them on TV. We see them in movies. Bad guides. And our temptation is to revert back to that, especially when things get hard. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't follow those guides. They're not clear. They're not qualified. And above all else, they're not alert. They're not aware. These are dangerous times. We need our guide to be alert. Look at Hebrews verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It's a lot of stuff right there, but this is the first of five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Don't go back. Don't turn away. Stick with the guide. The Hebrews are tempted. They want to go back. And he talks about this word drifting. Drifting away from God. What does that mean? Well, the word to drift is like a ring slipping off of your finger. Just coming right off. And that sounds accidental. When you think about your faith that way, you can be really concerned. You can be like, oh, can I just wake up one day and and I've lost my faith? It's just slipped right off. And I don't think that's what's going on here at all. It reminds me of the book, The Lord of the Rings. I know I reference it quite a bit. But in the book, there's this ring, this ring of power. And it's trying, uh, it it represents all the evil and the malice inside of of, of the chief villain in the story. And it kind of has a mind of its own. And one of the characters tells another character, remember, the ring is trying to get back to its master. You don't actually own it. It will abandon you at its first convenience. At a moment of critical, a critical juncture, when you're relying on it, when you need it, it's going to fail you. And if your faith is in other guides, if your faith is really in other things and not in Jesus Christ, it will slip off your finger at a critical moment when you need it. It will betray you. And you'll be left there sitting, I thought I was trusting in God the whole time. No. You were trusting in your own control. You are trusting in your own means, your own efforts, the wisdom and ideas of other people. But Jesus has offered us a great salvation. This is what it says in the passage. It says, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This great guidance. Remember, the revelation that God showed us, we've rejected it. And that has subjected us to punishment. But Jesus stands in the gap for us. He he takes the punishment for us. That's what his death and his burial is all about. And he's raised to life. And so we can trust him as our guide. And what's more is, he's alert. And he's not just alert to the dangers that are out there. Absolutely he is. But he's also alert to those of us who have fallen by the wayside. Maybe you did follow a different guide. Maybe you have followed something else that you thought was going to work for you. And now you're out in the thorns and the thistles and you're way off the path. And you're like, I don't know how to get back. Jesus is looking for you. He's alert to your need. He will reach his nail-scarred hands into those thorns and pull you out if you will just reach for him. He's already had thorns pressed upon his brow for you. He doesn't mind so much reaching into thorns to get you out again. He's already paid that price. Why struggle through the thorns and the thistles of the wilds when he has blazed a path for you already with his own body, with his own blood? Maybe some of us have wandered a little bit. Maybe it's not that we never knew him, but we knew him at one point, but we've tried to forge our own path. He's there for you. Come back to him. 
He's faithful to let you return. And that's ultimately where we are today. You need to stick with the guide. He's qualified. He's very clear and he's aware of what's going on. He's the only one capable of doing it, of getting you through this life alive. And what's more is we need to stick together. We're a people designed to travel in community. That's what Christianity is. We need one another. You're not supposed to go off on your own because it says here at the end of verse 4, the Holy Spirit distributed gifts according to his will. You have gifts and you have gifts and you have gifts that we need. It's like a group that goes out on a, on a, on a caravan, a, a group together, a traveling together. And some of them have one thing and some people have another thing. We all need each other. I need you. You need me. You're like, I need you to wrap this sermon up, Travis. We need one another. VBS is this week as we pray. Are you going to continue to pray for VBS? We need your prayers. Are you going to serve? Guess what? Still need help. Come on. Let's work together. That is what the body of Christ is for. The hands and feet of Jesus. We have a guide that we need. He's clear. and He's qualified and he is alert. But we often forget this. And that is why God in his grace didn't just leave us to figure this out on our own. He gave us the elements. He gave us the Lord's Supper. He gave to us physical things to remember, to remind us, hey, you need me. And I desperately want you. 